Thank you for joining us for this episode of Inside Town Hall. I'm your host, Madeline Shields. Joining me on the program this month is City Councilor Marshall Selberg, and his guests for this first segment are mental health and substance abuse um, experts. And we have Dr. Jen Tingley, the Chief Medical Officer, and Mary Michaels, who's the Public Health Prevention Coordinator. Welcome to Inside Town Hall. Let's talk a little bit about the mental health of people living in our community. Yeah, I think kind of the, the reason I thought it would be a nice tie-in with um, this month's edition of the show is that there is a program coming up, and I don't know, we can probably, whenever you want to touch mm -hmm. on that, but mm -hmm. um, it's coming up soon in the next couple of weeks. But when you talk about mental health and addiction and those type of things, I think it's something that needs uh, a lot more attention. I think there's stigmas to it where it's getting better, but it needs a lot of work, and I'm hoping things like this will help. I know you guys are too, and hopefully we can mm -hmm. make people aware today. Right. Yeah. What is it that we need to know about our own mental health? I think most of us think there's nothing wrong with me, mm -hmm. but I think there's a lot of things wrong with a lot of us, you know, yeah. that we don't know is, is a mental health disorder. Right. right. I mean, I think it's important to realize that at any point in somebody's life, it's very, very likely that they're going to struggle with some mental health issue whether it's some anxiety, and that might just be situational. There may actually be a diagnosis of generalized anxiety or major depression. Think about women that have babies. It's very common for women to feel sad, down, depressed after their baby is born. I think it's just important to realize that mental health affects most of us at any point in our life. Nobody's immune from this, and so it's important to have these conversations because we do stigmatize it and make it seem like, ooh, I don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about it mm -hmm. because it's out there and it affects so many people. What is your role and how do you help folks? Well, with our program, Live Well Sioux Falls, we're really talking about how do we live well as whole individuals, and that's physical health and mental health. And the two are so closely connected. Yeah. Um, oftentimes yeah. you see people living with chronic disease, but they also have maybe a little depression or anxiety because they are trying to manage mm -hmm. that chronic disease. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to talk about too is that mental health addiction, these are diseases, these are chronic diseases, and they need to be talked about um, openly as such, just like we say, get your flu shot. It should be, this is the condition, these are opportunities for treatment, and, and, and it's just normal, just like we would talk about anything else. And so we're really the awareness arm of um, get, letting the community know what resources are available, while you know, Dr. Tingley in the clinic setting is working with these patients on a day-to-day -day basis. But mm -hmm. in order for her to be able to work with patients mm -hmm. or other providers around the community, people first have to know what's available to them. And so the event that we're having on September 25th is called Even Here, a community conversation about opioids because that's what this is all about, is letting people know that mental health and addiction happen anywhere to anyone, even here. And I think sometimes we think like, well, that's a big city problem, and it's not, it's here. And so the event is really gonna focus on opioids, but it's kicking off a larger conversation we wanna have in the community about all types of mental health and addiction issues. Um, and so it's a morning session that is free and open to the public, and then a more policy-focused luncheon that's like, what are other, cities and community, mm -hmm. you know, cities and states mm -hmm. across the country doing to address issues. And so um, you can go to evenhere.org and that's got uh, information about mental health and addiction, but it also has specific information about this event. And it features uh, Sam Quinones who wrote this book, Dreamland. And this chronicles the story of really how did the opioid epidemic, epidemic even mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. in our country. And it's just a great collection of storytelling from where the drugs come from, but then how that network spreads and what's the role of all these different industries um, that has created kind of the situation we find ourselves in today. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about the drug use that can happen as as the result of a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've heard that, you know, a lot of people, they don't feel right. They either, mm -hmm. it's depression or, but they don't know what's wrong with them. Right. And so then they mask these feelings mm -hmm. with alcohol mm -hmm. and drugs. Mm -hmm. Is that common and has okay. it been a common problem for a long time? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think if somebody is feeling anxious, if you consume a substance that makes you feel more relaxed, it calms you down. So you'll start to see 
um, patients that are struggling with anxiety, depression, start to move towards substances almost to self-medicate because maybe they're afraid to talk about it with their family members or their medical provider. Absolutely, we see that. It's just the same when somebody is tired and we drink caffeine. I mean, we are treating a condition that we are feeling. And so if somebody is struggling with depression or anxiety, they may reach to something that is not healthy and it is not a good coping mechanism. And, and the, don't they yeah. say isn't it about 20% of the population has some sort of a mental health disorder or something to that effect? And I always kind of think of it too where people always classify it as well, like you say, I think the title of this program, Anyone, Anywhere, because some people think, well, it's a certain, maybe it's the poor, it's the kids, it's this right. that seem to have these problems. Yeah. And there's lots of people that you look at, you'd never guess, they yeah, seem right. to have everything and they're white knuckling it through the day because they're struggling with a, right. you know, an issue or an addiction. Yep. And I really think it's good and I hope that we really continue to promote this program because I'm sure there'll be people coming out and going, that kind of speaks to me. I've been yeah, that's dealing what we with hope. something. And, yeah. Yeah. and in our community health needs assessment that we released earlier this year, mm -hmm. we did a resident survey and 37% of the population that responded to that survey in Sioux Falls said they had a past diagnosis of depression. Another 37% mm -hmm. said anxiety. 38% said they binge drink. Uh, so we know that these issues are here. And so again, mm -hmm. starting that conversation and bringing partners in the community together to make sure that you know, resources are available for whatever the, the person yep. needs. Yep. Yep. You know, you hear a lot about celebrities who are facing these mental health issues mm -hmm. and with the occurrence of uh, suicide, has mm -hmm. that brought this more to the forefront and do you think it has helped people who think, okay, I'm just your every av every mm -hmm. average person. Right. Um, if this happens to these people who seem to have it all, right. is it helping? Is it helping people to, to look at themselves? Well, I think what it's doing is, it is, I mean, celebrities have a certain amount of media attention mm -hmm. around them, and so it is bringing these issues to the forefront. I mean, we see somebody struggling with um, an opiate dependency, a heroin dependency, or the suicides that we see, or just the accidental deaths when somebody's mixing too many substances together. I think that visibility of, oh my gosh, that person has just died because of this, it allows it to be publicized. But I think what we need to do in our community is recognize that this is a conversation that we should be having with one another, we should be having in our clinics, in our exam rooms, with our teachers, with our church leaders. Um, these are conversations that you know, it's not just the celebrities that this is happening to. It is everybody, anybody, yeah. anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to normalize it and not glamorize yeah. it. Yes. It's right. like, you know, this is, it's a serious issue and yep. we want to make sure that from that earliest age we're supporting our kids as they grow up. There's so many, so many pressures on the kids right now. Right. With yeah. School and drugs and alcohol and just yeah. social media and comparing themselves and just all of that, figuring yeah. out what you want to do for your life. You know, right. by the time you're 16. So it's yeah. really starting from that earlier age, but then again, you know, getting into work sites and supporting employees so they are, mm -hmm. you know, can stay productive and healthy at work and in our mm -hmm. churches and in other organizations around the community. Yeah. Yeah, I think people get numb to that too, where they think, well, rock stars, money, I mean, that kind of comes with it. We see yeah. that every day. But if you do see people that, that live in your everyday life that are professionals right. and you find out somebody's maybe been struggling with something, you're just, you know, you'd hate to say that that's good news to somebody else, but they might go, oh, I'm not alone here. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow, I, I would have never thought that. I would have, yeah, just mm -hmm. making people yeah. aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're right. It is about, you know, one in five people this year are going to be diagnosed with some mental illness or mental health disorder. And, and really it's greater than 50% of every person in this country will have had some mental health issue throughout their lifetime. So greater than 50% odds, and this is not a rarity. Mm -hmm. Are people more comfortable telling their physicians? Because when you go to a doctor, even for any, whether mm -hmm. it's a cold or if it's a physical, yep. they ask you, "Do you are you safe? Do you feel mm -hmm. safe? Um, do you want to hurt yourself? Yep. They ask you these basic questions. Yep. Do you think more people are comfortable answering them truthfully now than they maybe used to be? I sure hope so. I hope so. I think the, the, the answer is if they feel comfortable and knowing that if I say yes to this, what are they going to provide me? What are they going to offer me to help with this? I mean, if somebody says, yes, I'm struggling and there's no response, 
that is going to make them kind of clam up and not and be forthcoming the next time somebody asks. But I do think within the medical profession, and certainly we are seeing mental health as it's just a, another vital sign. I mean, we mm -hmm. ask those questions just as we're checking the blood pressure and the temperature when mm -hmm. a patient comes in because we need to know how a person's mental health is because it is just as important as their physical health, and those two things are always combined. They're intertwined. Let's talk a little bit about that. If you live with depression, mm -hmm. it can physically make you sick. Is Absolutely. that true? Absolutely. How does that work and why is that the case? Right. Well, I mean, we think about people that are struggling with depression. Many people overeat. Mm -hmm. Some people don't eat enough, but mm -hmm. some people overeat. They make poor food choices. Well, that leads to diabetes. That leads to high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, there is this link that um, untreated depression may even lead to cancer. I mean, there's just this connection that a mental health diagnosis will lead and, and lead to perhaps a new diagnosis or certainly not taking care of a physical health issue that somebody has. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if somebody does have diabetes and they're struggling with depression, the likelihood of them taking their medication as prescribed, the likelihood of eating a healthy diet, of exercising, mm -hmm. those risk factors are there. And so we have to make sure that we're addressing somebody's mental health if we're going to be taking care of their physical health yeah. diagnosis. How do we um, get to that point where we convince people that this is a medical problem and not you know you know like people think well they're just gonna think I'm crazy right. but it's right. actually hormonal and it's it's mm -hmm. something right. you mm -hmm. cannot control it's just like right. having a cold or the flu or yep. any other disease how yeah. how do you convince people of that <laughs> We just keep talking about it. I yeah. mean, just, yeah. this is exactly yeah, why we're doing this yes, program, exactly. and hopefully, this is just the first of many yeah. community-wide conversations that we can share. No, this is the science. This is what yeah. what medical journals and science and yeah. research show. This is the physiological yeah. connection between what's going on in your body and how you're feeling. Yeah. And the more we talk about it in meeting people where they are, so it's not, mm -hmm. you know, okay, we're gonna do this one program, you come here and learn, but we're gonna, you know, get out into schools and churches yeah. and work sites yeah. and just find people where they are and have those conversations and have it be peer to peer and employer to employee mm -hmm. and pastor to parishioner and find those trusted voices that can share the message that it's okay and you are not alone and it, this is not because you are a failure or you have a shortcoming, this is, this is something that's happening within you and, and there's resources that we can help you with. And I think there's, you know, we're talking about a triage center, I know, mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. recently. And that's yeah. a whole other show and topic. But I mean, I always talk about, well, the step, I, not just me, but a lot of people. Once the triage center is here, well, where do you triage people to? Where can people go from right. there once yeah. you're, you know, how do you get better? Is there, what are the options for me to go visit somewhere? I'm just, again, there's probably people behind their doors who are worried and white knuckling it going, I don't know where to go or what to do. And you're hoping mm -hmm. that they start to see, well, there is an answer. There is a place to go. And it, there's mm -hmm. putting a microphone to it in, in programs like this. Hopefully mm -hmm. you start showing people again, right. there's hope, there's things to do and you're not alone. And I do think it's getting better, but it's still, I think there's still a huge stigma. Mm -hmm. in my I, opinion. I have one last question. How do children help convey this message and is it our children bringing this message home to the adults in their lives you know way back when when children learned that smoking was bad they go home and shame their parents you know <laughs> you can, you you can't smoke it's terrible for all of us and fewer people smoked and so now is this the same are children learning about this and saying you know this is this is a real health issue that we mm -hmm. all uh, need to address? Well, I mean, I, I certainly think that children are, are more exposed to, to these issues. I mean, the social media pervasiveness is there, and so I think kids are talking to one another, um, and hopefully their relationships with their parents and their grandparents are healthy enough that they can come home and say, hey, I just saw so-and-so, or maybe they're talking about their friend that is struggling with this, and that leads into a conversation that perhaps they need to be having with their parents. I mean, I know within the school districts, mm -hmm. they are always assessing just mm -hmm. the health of, and the health includes the mental health of those kids as well as their physical health. Um, so I do think that these are conversations that children are bringing home. 
Um, and, it, and it's recumbent upon us as adults to make sure that we're not shutting that down mm -hmm. um, because it's important that we make it a safe thing to talk about, mm -hmm. a normal thing that just a, a parent and a child should be able to talk about. I think always the kids always learn new stuff and they're like this conveyor of, yeah. of this message mm -hmm. that they learn. And, and you know, yeah. even as a parent, I learned a lot of things that my mm -hmm. kids were exposed to that they didn't teach us, you know, when we were well, young. For sure. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate the information. Yes, thank you. Thanks okay. for having us. When we come back, we're going to meet two of the city's superheroes. We will be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Peyton with Falls Community Health here today to talk about diabetes. Diabetes is a health condition that affects how your body turns sugar into energy. More than 30 million people in the United States have diabetes. Risk factors for diabetes include being 45 years or older, being overweight, physically inactive, or having a parent or sibling with diabetes. Common symptoms include frequent urination, increased thirst, and unexplained weight loss. Diabetes can cause serious health complications if left untreated, including heart disease and stroke. If you have any questions about diabetes, contact your primary care provider or Falls Community Health. Well, welcome back to Inside Town Hall, where we are visiting with City Councilor Marshall Selberg. And on this segment, we are going to meet two superheroes. And let's introduce them. We have uh, Rich McCorris. Did I say that right? Absolutely. All right. And we have John McIntyre. And Marshall, tell us a little bit about what is a superhero? Well, about, uh, I think it was the first month of last year, we started a program, and what we wanted was a citizen recognition program. Now, obviously, at City Hall, you're always going to have plenty of drama and debate, and that's all part of a natural way of doing government, and that's part of the gig, and that's terrific. But what we wanted to do is that instead of always having, a, you know, an argument and kind of head-to-head -head battle, we thought it would be nice once in a while to focus on some people that are out there going the extra mile and doing some things around town, kind of unsung heroes in the community. So what we did is we came up with the program basically where we put it out there for folks to tell us about some people that maybe you work with in volunteer organizations, maybe it's churches, it could be about anything, and tell us about these people and bring them forward and let's highlight those folks at City Hall and through City Link and through the avenues that we have. It's, it, you know, throughout our city government, like I say, if we've got an avenue and a microphone, let's not always just use it to bicker and argue about policy. Let's talk about some people who are doing it right. So I think we've had about 20 some people that have gotten this award since we started it. Um, these are two of the more recent um, um, recipients of the award and uh, uh, very good recipients as well. So yes. anyways, so far it's been a terrific program. Um, I thought what we'd do today is, you know, obviously learn more about them, but again, highlight the program some more and remind people as we go along too, just how the program works and how they can put people up for it as well. Okay, well let's meet Rich McCorris. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, why do you think you were nominated for the Superhero Award? <laughs> and you won it, because that's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, Rich McCorris, and I uh, went to college here in Sioux Falls, the University of Sioux Falls, and been here ever since, since 2000, and uh, started doing some ministry in church, and then I've been in nonprofit work through the Sioux Falls Ministry Center, Compassion Child Care, Hope Coalition, and ever, other efforts like that, and a chaplain with the Sioux Falls Police Department and the Minneapolis County Sheriff's Office. Great. So, and you were nominated by someone that you work with? I think a community member. I don't know exactly who nominated me. I think I've got a hunch, but I don't have that official, I guess. All right. Well, great. Okay, and let's meet John McIntyre, who is wearing his banquet shirt. So yeah, you were probably. nominated through the banquet yeah. feeding ministry. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've done at the banquet, John. Well, I, we were talking before we turned on the mics that um, through my church, I've been down 34 years, you say it's? Okay. Yeah, the banquet opened and, in 1985. Uh, and back in the, um, in the 90s, uh, I retired in 93. And so I had more free time. And my wife and I started going at that about the time that the backpack program, the SOS program started. We got very involved with that because both of us were retired educators. and. Uh, so we spent quite a few mornings and afternoons and sometimes evenings down in the basement of the old banquet down on North Main Avenue and sorting out school supplies and doing this and that and the other thing. And 
Then I found out they had a kitchen upstairs, and um, I got introduced to Marvella, the food service director at that time, and she let me, um, you know, help out in the kitchen, and that kind of grew from there. And it started out to be, I kind of promised to do it one morning a week, and now, now it's up to five mornings a week. And mm -hmm. uh, I always say from nine till noon, and uh, last week a couple of the noons were three o'clock and four o'clock in the afternoon. The, 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 the delivery doorbell will ring, and then uh, our plans change. You I know, think, yeah, you know, I think uh, when when people come in the back door, they recognize John. I think they think him on, he's on staff because I think he's always there. And he also is a host in the dining room, so you don't just work mornings, you work nights as well. A few nights, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and I think you were saying they were talking about he volunteered about 15 hours a week, and you said that might even be not even half of about the amount of time that you do. Well, it varies. It there. Some weeks right. it's only 15. If you right. figure three hours a morning, Five is five, that's 15, but... I think sometimes he spends 15 week, hours a week just in the freezer <laughs> with a winter coat on, uh, organizing yeah. uh, frozen foods. Well, we, I, there's, a, there's a lot of other people down there that are working there hard. Are. And, and are. Mert has taken over the freezer, so I don't have my coat <laughs> as often on as often as I did. Well, maybe we have, now we have another nominee maybe for that. There we go. That, that would be a good one. We've got to leave. <laughs> Uh, Rich, let's talk a little bit about what got you um, on this path to help others. Well, actually, kind of interesting that we're doing this here. What got me on this path is a former city councilor, Kermit Staggers. 2003, I was going to the University of Sioux Falls. Kermit Staggers was teaching there. Kermit and I were joking around one day because I was watching a city council meeting where somebody was complaining at public input about not helping the poor enough. And I was kind of giving Kermit a hard time, just kind of joking with him, and Kermit turned and looked at me and said, well, you should do something about that. <laughs> and uh, Kermit drove me up by the prison and introduced me to this person that was struggling, and that was in 2003. And that started the whole process of being involved in a variety of issues of poverty here in Sioux Falls. And I know you've got the one you should talk about that you just put together here, your, uh, the School for the Deaf Campus. Yeah, really excited. We just uh, part of a team that helped purchase the School for the Deaf Campus, and we're transforming that into the Empower Campus, basically a home for a variety of nonprofits, all focused on serving lower income families in our community. So we're hoping to bring together kind of a mall of services that benefits everything from birth all the way through up adult. Do you have committed nonprofits to move into that? We have area? about eight committed nonprofits right now, and then we're in the process of working with the city and other parties about development of the land that's on the site. Do you hope that that's kind of a one-stop shop for folks who may be living in poverty or who are um, dealing with any other kinds of struggles in their life? Yeah, our, our vision is the working poor in Sioux Falls. Those who have a job that still can't, are not self-sufficient, they might need child care, utility assistance, a bike to work, counseling, whatever that might be. There'd be different services that focus on different avenues. I don't, either of you can answer, but what, what's your advice for other folks who maybe are out there watching and, you know, they're retired, um, maybe they're looking for something to do, really don't want a part-time job, but what would you encourage them to do? Um, there are so many opportunities. He mentioned several and uh, uh, get involved in your, in your, your own church with, with uh, whatever social concerns that church has a particular interest in, uh, uh, and uh, I belong to a service club, and uh, we get involved in projects, and uh, so I get involved in that, those kinds of things where you are around other people, and uh, just you don't have to look very hard to find something to do in Sioux Falls that's going to help somebody, and then it kind of blossoms. I, I there's a lot of things I'd like to be doing, but I don't have time. <laughs> when I retired, I was quite sure I would. I just had in mind that I probably would drive for a project car. It's another service that is very beneficial to many people in Sioux Falls that don't have their own transportation, and uh, it just never happened. I, and I, I don't have time to do it now. I have friends that do it, and I, I appreciate what they're doing, but. Uh, that uh, you know, a person could, could go on for a long time about what, what you can do in Sioux Falls. But uh, look around. Um, the banquet is always looking for more volunteers and, uh, and groups to serve. And once you've done it, you get caught. It's, uh, it's uh, rather addictive. 
You're uh, now you're you're younger, and you started this out as a young man to um, seek out places to help and people to help. What would your advice be for maybe high schoolers or college students to um, get involved, and and what are the benefits of doing that? Yeah, I think number one thing I'd encourage people to do is to get to know the people that they're serving. Sometimes it's easy to go do a project that you just get to do something in the back and not really meet the people. Once you meet the people and you get to know them, it puts a face with it, it changes everything when you know that, wow, this is impacting a person. So the work that John is doing in the freezer is impacting real people and John is interacting with them by hosting. And once you know the people, and for me that changed the game was once I knew the young children and saw that the children maybe didn't have the opportunities that I had, that changed everything for me. Well, and it, like John said, it does become addictive because once you know, you know, there's always this thing that people think, I'm just one person, I can't really do much. Do you agree with that? Yeah, people have that mindset, but man, if everybody helps one, all of a sudden right there, the community's transformed. Yeah, just do something. That's what you yep. tell a lot of people. Well, where do we start? Well, just put the first foot forward and do something. Yep. Yes, and there's so many fringe benefits. I have made so many friends among other volunteers and among the banquet guests, people that I look forward to meeting again. You know, I look forward every week to going down on, on Thursday. I know this particular group of people is going to be there. And this morning, Friday morning, I, I was looking forward to a couple people that I really like, and I would have never, never met them if, if I hadn't been down at the banquet. And they came in to volunteer, and they stuck around, and it's, it's so it's, it's, you're not just giving, you're getting. You, you receive a lot of, of uh, well, it just makes me keep going. Well, it's a, it's a social circle yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, there's, there's treats involved, there's coffee, people get to visit. Um, and then that, do you see that sometimes that moves out of, from the volunteer uh, location into other aspects of life, where maybe they get together later? Yeah, the people that you serve with end up becoming your best friends as you serve alongside and you find out you have similar passions and interests. Marshall, on the city council side, how do you think this impacts citizens? How does it impact neighborhoods when people get involved and they get to know either the nonprofit in their neighborhood or just in helping out their neighbors? You know, it's somebody once said, life begins when you begin to serve, and it's people, you know, like these gentlemen who kind of set the example where they're the backbone of your community where they really go out and reach out and try to find ways to help. And then, again, that's another idea behind the program is that if people will see a show like this or see people like this honored and go, geez, I never thought of that. Well, maybe I could step forward and do things to that. So you kind of hope it has a snowball effect that people see this and go, yeah, I've always kind of thought about doing something, but I don't know what. Well, this might put a little seed in there. So you kind of hope to use, as far as the city council goes, at least my view of it, is that when you have a microphone, if you can use that to help but again, highlight folks like this and the opportunities out there. That's what you hope you can do. Well, there are lots of ways to get involved. Marshall, can you tell us how to nominate someone if they have a particular person in mind? You go to SiouxFalls.org slash MyHero, and then you just go in and quite simply you type up, I think, you 250 some words. It's probably a process that might take you 10 or 15 minutes to you know, again, nominate somebody and submit it, and then we take it from there. We've got a little committee that looks it over, and we go from there. And I would say, again, we talked about how do you, where do you volunteer? People always think Google, Google volunteer opportunities in Sioux Falls. But there's lots of opportunity, and we'd like to see at Carnegie and on shows like this soon. I know there's a lot of gentlemen and ladies out there who do work like this. I hope we see them soon. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you both for all of the work that you do in the Sioux Falls community and all of the people that you help. And that is our time for Inside Town Hall. If you want to get a hold of any of your city councilors, you can contact them at SiouxFalls.org. Thanks for watching.